Previously on The Lost Carnival. My name is Sergi, leader of the Bird family. Please find enclosed a first class plane ticket leaving tomorrow and taking you to New York. <laughs> Series 2, Episode 1 Sergei's Challenge. You can tell an awful lot about a city through its libraries. And this being New York, of course, it's got one of the best. The public library on Fifth Avenue. I'd much rather spend an afternoon here than standing on top of the Empire State or getting crushed in Times Square. Anyway, this isn't a travel guide. I'm here to do a job. Tomorrow afternoon I've got my meeting with Sergei. So I thought I'd come here, go through some old newspapers and see what I could dig up about him and his company. That was four hours ago. And unless I've missed something in this old stack of New York Times and Wall Street journals, there's nothing to go on. The company, Bird Incorporated, is successful, rich, ever so solid and ever so dull, frankly. As for Sergei himself, there's barely a comment. The only thing I have found is on this old microfiche machine. I love these things. It's a small editorial from way back in the 1930s. Sergey Bird, it reads, seems to have taken our favourite song, Let's Misbehave, to his heart, leaving a trail of empty bottles, broken hearts and sore losers in his wake. His brooding features and devil-may-care flamboyance have made him the object of more than a few husbands and wives' jealousy. If there were an award for the talk of the town, He'd not only win it, he'd drink the finest champagne from it, then throw it over his shoulder and head straight on out for the next party. As it happens, an old colleague of mine, one of the best investigative journalists I ever worked with, certainly, uh, has been living over here for the last few years. We worked together back in England, but she's, she's now in New York working on a paper here. She's called Hildy Johnson. And I'm just heading up here to a diner on second to meet her and hoping she's going to be able to tell me a little bit more than all those newspapers did. OK, what can I get you guys? I'll have a schnitzel with fries and three gherkins. No, four gherkins. OK. I'll have the same, please. Only hold the gherkins, please. OK, that's great. Be right with you. So, Arthur, you're going behind the walls of the mighty bird fortress. Can I sneak in with you? I wondered how long it would take you to ask. So come on, what can you tell me? Well, as you're paying for my schnitzel, I can tell you that that clipping got it right. The original Sergei really was the man about town. He'd drink, he'd dance, he'd be at six different parties at night and never get to bed before sunrise. Now, the odd thing about it, though, was he never seemed to be enjoying himself. It was more like he was trying to distract himself from something, from whatever it was he was really thinking about. You sound like you were there yourself. I wasn't, but I did speak to someone who was. An old society hack I interviewed once for a piece I wrote about New York back in its heyday. He said that Sergei was one of the most charismatic men he'd ever met, but that after he did his Willy Wonka trick, he never saw him again. Is Willy Wonka trick? Well, don't you remember how Willy Wonka disappeared from public view to run his business without ever being seen? Yes. Well, that's precisely what your Sergei did. You know their business has all the five top floors of that skyscraper? I didn't, but carry on. Well, he has the top floor all for himself. Went in there, shut the door, and that was it. And you're the only person I've ever known to get a golden ticket. We don't even know when Sergei died. The company's run by the board. They never give interviews, they just make their money and they swear their employees to secrecy. It was funny though, that old hack I mentioned, he said he could have sworn he'd seen Sergei getting into a limousine over on Fifth Avenue many years later. He said it was like being whisked back in time. He realised it must have been Sergei's son, though no one ever knew that Sergei had a son. But still, the resemblance was so close, it gave him a real shock. It's funny you should say that. He might have been onto something there. Intriguing as ever, Arthur. One thing, though, before you do head up to the top of that skyscraper to meet him, I have a hunch of my own about the Bird Company. They've always been so straight, so clean, so solid. 
but I've always had the feeling there's something a little dark about them, a little dangerous. It's maybe nothing. Well, now it's you who's onto something. If we weren't in public, I'd take my shirt off and show you the proof. My word, Arthur. After all these years, I never knew you cared. So listen, and I'll tell you what I know. It all started when I received this wax cylinder from a little girl called Papu Anjini. Within a month or two, I was taking two bullets up the Medina in Casablanca. Ooh, painful. Arthur. Sergey. The same. Come through. This is a, a very nice place you've got here. That's, that's quite some view of the city. Oh, I find it uh, looks best from a significant distance. Not like you yourself. You look extremely well for a man of how many years now? More than a hundred yet? <laughs> let's, let's not be playful, Arthur. You know how powerful the magic of the phoenix was. Having it here with me for so long has left me somewhat perkier than the average centurion. And that's why you did your disappearing act, isn't it? So no one would notice how they were getting older while you stayed looking so young. That's very astute. Thank you. As a matter of fact, I told a very well-placed journalist all about it yesterday as insurance. In case this trip to the top floor ends badly and I take a tumble out of the window, it'll be all over the internet before I'm all over the pavement. Hmm. As I say, very astute. But I'm not that kind of man, Arthur. You have misjudged me, even before meeting me. In fairness, you did arrange to have me shot and killed. Don't you remember? Not at all. I arranged to have you shaken up a little. However, my loyalty to old allies meant I picked someone for the job who couldn't be trusted to stay balanced. She didn't hold bang, let's put it that way. Well, for that, I am sorry, Arthur. You are family, after all. Well, I thank you for the apology. Though I do hope I came here for rather more than that. I wanted to meet you more than anything. Having listened to your recordings about me, I did feel that I came out of it rather badly. Not that I care for public opinion, you understand, but I do so dislike seeing half-truths and dissimulations passed as fact. Veracity should never be sacrificed on the altar of storytelling. I told it as I saw it, and I've seen nothing to suggest I've got anything wrong. So, what else do you want? Ah, yes. We are, as the man said, we are drifting back and forth between each other in the warm New York four o'clock light. Sorry? Never mind. So, yes, what I want. For years, I've been hidden away up here, living a half-life in this opulent coffin. And once I got used to it, I didn't mind. It was enough to make money and remember the glory days. However, things have changed since the carnival last year. I was there, you see. Heavily disguised, of course, but it rekindled something deep inside me that I thought was forever dormant. And what was that, may I ask? The love of the carnival, Arthur. Its colour, its smells, its drama. It is nothing short of life itself to me. All else is second-hand and second-best. And so? And so, I want back in. I want you to go to the ingenues and challenge them to a grand carnival showdown. My troop against theirs, face to face. The crowd will choose the winner, and the loser will forever close their operation. Why can't you just set up and do your own thing? Why does it have to be you and them? Well, this goes back too long, Arthur. There is room for just one carnival, you know. Back in the old days, both camps were so busy wandering and worrying about what the other was doing that we ripped ourselves apart. What? It was you sabotaging them all along. I've got the evidence. I've heard Papu's recording. I know the truth. No, Arthur. You know her side of the truth. Both carnivals were just as busy undermining the other, or sabotaging the other, as you put it. It was the way of things, you see. 
To be honest, it was a grabby business, but it was the business we were involved with, on both sides. But it need not be like that now. We can have a clean contest, and the winner can get on with what counts, enchanting the audience, without fear of dirty tricks. I need you to deliver the challenge, Arthur. I'm sorry, Sergei. You clearly are as charming a man as people say. But I don't believe you. And even if I did, I'm not prepared to act as some grubby go-between. So, thank you for the plane ticket and for the hotel. But I think I'll be going. Wait! Uh, Arthur, there is more. Go on. It wasn't just the carnival I was in love with. It was Popu. We were friends as children, when the two carnivals were slightly more friendly. Then, as we got older, I became besotted. But before I could act on that, that feeling, her family discovered the phoenix. My father, shall we say, appropriated it. You mean stole it? Well, as you will. Popu's father died. She thought it was because of the phoenix, but he had been living a showman's life and was never going to live into old age. I went to her, begged her to bring the carnivals together. A new start, you see. I asked if we might be together too. And what did she say? She got angry. She spared me, Alter. Called my family murderers. She picked up one of the strongman's dumbbells and she threw it at me. Could have killed me. I didn't see her again for years. My father brought me over here. We set up in business. I was hurt and angry and took it out on myself. That wasn't partying, Arthur. It was punishment. Anyway, eventually I calmed down, took stock and sank from view. But now, I won't back in. It's a sad story if it's true. But I'll be honest, I don't know what's true and what showmanship, Sergei. What is true, Arthur, is that if you don't take the challenge to the ingenues, and if they don't accept, I will use every one of my millions of dollars breaking them. We'll start at theft of the phoenix, and by the time I finished, there'll be nothing, Arthur. I want this too much, and I have had enough of this half-life. As a friend of mine once told me many years ago, I would rather be ashes than dust. I would rather that my spark should burn out in a brilliant blaze than it should be stifled by dry rot. The function of man is to live, not to exist. I shall not waste my days trying to prolong them. I shall use my time. This is a final boarding call for the Air Lingus, flight EI-301 to Margaret International Airport. Right, well, I'm at the JFK departure lounge now in the airport. I'm waiting to go home. After what was an extraordinary meeting with Sergei in his apartment. Yeah, I'm going to go back. I'm going to have to track down the ingenues, deliver Sergei's challenge to them. But in honesty, I, I don't know what or whom to believe right now. If only I could work out what to ask Hamish and Popu and the rest of them when I do track them down. Just to make sure it's, it's their side I'm still on. Maybe I'm just too close to all this to fathom it out. So uh, I'm asking for your help, if you're listening to this. Of course you're listening to this. Uh, and you've got any clues, any thoughts, any, any leads? Uh, I really could do with some help. All remaining passengers, please proceed immediately to boarding at 